Welcome to Renolda Church. You can use your mobile device to fill out our digital connect card, or you can fill out the connect card that you received when you arrived at one of our campuses today. Let us know how we can pray for you or your loved ones this week. The connect card is a great way to help us stay in touch across all of our campuses and pray for one another. It is almost time for Advent. I can't believe it either. Join us for a five week Advent journey as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. We will be utilizing the Advent reading plan, The Everlasting Light, from She Reads Truth and He Reads Truth to explore how scripture presents Jesus as the embodiment of light in our dark world. We will be invited to live as people of the light, as his children, as we celebrate his coming and await his future return. Also, we have our 2021, brand new, our 2021 Advent study guides available at every single one of our campuses and online. You can download a copy in English or in Espanol using the link below, or you can grab a copy if you're visiting one of our campuses today. Take advantage of this free resource as you prepare your hearts for Christmas. And we invite you once again to join one of the Advent groups meeting near you if you would like to discuss these passages with others. There are instructions on how to join a group on the introductory page of the Advent study guide as well. If you want to stay in the know and have all of this information dropped right in your inbox, use the link below to sign up for our digital newsletter. We call it the days ahead. And again, we're so glad you're here. Let us worship the living God together. Welcome to Renola Church. The world has 7.8 billion people in it today. Three billion of those people have never had a gospel witness at all. 7,000 people groups have zero believers in them. And the United States has about 480 ethnic groups living here. In Greek, the word is ta ethne, the peoples. Not people, but the peoples with an S, the nations, the ethnic groups. As we read the Bible, Old Testament and New, God's heart for the nations, the tribes, the tongues, the languages, the peoples of the earth is abundantly clear. My name is Mark Nicholson. I served uh, for many years as a missionary with my family on the highlands of the Tibetan Plateau. And now I continue to travel the world and preach the gospel with the small missions organization. I would like to invite you to join the missions movement right here in the Winston-Salem community by engaging in a class called Perspectives on, on the World Christian Movement. Very often it's shortened and just called Perspectives. It's gonna be held at Renolda Church this upcoming January for 15 weeks. But it's not just for Renolda folks, it's for everybody. Everybody needs to understand God's heart for the nations and their place in God's overarching plan of redemption. This class is designed to help you understand just that. For 15 weeks, you are going to be challenged, encouraged, uh, provoked to deep thought on issues that maybe you have never considered before theologically. Every Christian can do this, and every Christian should take a class similar to this one to understand God's heart and what His call is for all people as He has left us here on earth for a time to bear witness to His name, His fame, and His glory. Join us at Renolda Church beginning in January for 15 weeks for Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. I'll see you there.
Well, first, a word of welcome to everybody at our campuses, everybody in King and, and Clemens and Kernersville. Uh, it's so good to be with you. Uh, and everybody join us online as well. Uh, honor for, for us to be together. Uh, are you ready for some good news? Yes. You are gifted. You are not gifted in the way the world uses the term. Isn't it odd? We say, oh, we've got our gifted and talented students. We've got, you know, that person is so gifted. And I've always one thought, you know, in a secular world, what do they mean by that? Because the whole idea of a gift means that you have received it freely from someone else. It's not something inherent. It's not something that you're just born with. It's not something that you accomplish. To be gifted means to be the recipient of a gift. We're talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the second week as part of a series that I've called simply Higher Power. We're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let's look again at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul lists some of the gifts and has some important things to say about them. Now, Concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. So there is a way in which you can not be aware of the gifts of the Spirit and therefore may be missing something that God has for you. Verse 4, there are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit. Verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. And then in Romans 12, he lists uh, some that intersect and some additional gifts here. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, then use it in proportion to our faith. If service, then use it in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And this is important. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So the gifts of the Spirit are to be desired, which means that you can grow in the gifts. It means that you have gifts, and you can grow in those gifts, and you can have the Lord give you new gifts, all of that. So that's what we're talking about, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When our kids were little, I was the uh, guy that put them to uh, bed. If I was home, I was the one, and I uh, expected story time. Now, we read Bible stories, um, and we, uh, but we also had some fun stuff. Hank the cow dog, we would read. Oh, that's hilarious. And I think maybe one of their favorites, would I would tell them spy stories. Yes. There was a very special spy family named the Wrights. Bared some real similarities to our own family because there was a father in this family and his name was Alastair Debonair Wright. <laughs> his wife was Annalise and the son. <laughs> it is so funny, I just remember this because I gave them a chance to kind of pick out their own symbolic name. I said, Bennett, we're gonna call you Benjamin something. And he, he decided on it. He was Benjamin, if I was Alistair Debonair, he was Benjamin Millionaire Wright. <laughs> he already figured that out around age eight. He was gonna be a millionaire. And, uh, and then there was the little girl, Abilene. Like, uh, it's a city in Texas. I don't know how we came with that. But that was the spy family. The spy family had a red phone that was a direct hotline to the White House. And when the spy story was told, they would ring and Alistair would pick it up. And the President of the United States had an important mission for them. One of the coolest rooms in the spy family's house was the gadget room where there are all the tools that they would need for their spy work, all their espionage. And uh, they would always get equipped before every mission that they would go on. 
but there was some regular tools that each of the members of the family had. Alastair, the dad, had a special watch. I think it shot laser beams. I can't remember what all it did. And uh, the mother, Annalise, she had, well, it was very eerily similar to real life. Everything was in her pocketbook that you could possibly need. <laughs> there was something about her lipstick that was like a stun gun or something. I can't remember what. It was something about the lipstick. And, but I do remember this, that, that uh, Benjamin Millionaire, right, had a special chess set. This was at a time in which the kid was learning to play chess. And he had a special chess set that each pawn and each part of it was a different kind of explosive. And, um, and little, little one, little Abilene, uh, she had a special magic blanket because she'd always had her blankie all the time. And she could f unfurl that blanket and it would go and stretch across people and capture them in an impenetrable web. And so as long as everybody would use their special spy tools, the mission could be a success. We told those spy stories. I, I was thinking back about it. I thought, sounds kind of violent, doesn't it? I, and it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, we weren't killing people and this stuff. But, uh, but everybody wanted their, it's like, you can't really do this unless you've got your special gift. And, and there's a sense in which when you think about the mission of the church of Jesus, it's like the Lord has said, here's what you're going to do. You're going you're gonna to go and start in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and go to the ends of the earth, and you're going to share the gospel, and you're going to change the world. You're going to make disciples of people. You're going you're gonna to heal the sick. You're going to care for the poor. You're going to teach people and open up their understanding. And, you're, and, and just all of this, and you go, how are we going to do that? And it's like, in a sense, the Lord has also said, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to give you the tools that you need to do it. Now, my illustration breaks down at a lot of different levels, but it gets us into this idea that the body of Christ is, far from the way a lot of people perceive church now, is not a group of people that sits in an audience and watches something that's happening, but they are are the very hands and feet and eyes and ears of the body expressing the very power and the very presence of the Holy Spirit. And so I wanted to talk to you again today about spiritual gifts because last time we only touched on a few of them and I just thought we need to, we need to revisit this because I do not want you to be uninformed about spiritual gifts and I want you to yearn and long, as Paul said, desire these spiritual gifts in your life. Uh, you don't make them happen. They come by the Spirit. But you can want them, and you can ask the Lord, and you can recognize the gifts that you have and have them stirred into, into flame. Uh, let me review first the gifts of the Spirit. First and foremost, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, we realize these are spiritual. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, and as I pointed out, this literally in the Greek says concerning the spirituals, which means that what he's emphasizing here is this is not natural ability, as wonderful as that is. It's not natural gifts or talents, as wonderful as it is. Uh, if someone is just an artistic person or someone's a really good at math or somebody is uh, really athletic, whatever, these are things we say, well, that person's gifted. Well, but, but what we're talking about here are spiritual gifts wherein the Holy Spirit himself is bringing this gift through human means by connecting with you spiritually. They're also, they're gifts. Keep that in mind, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, variety of gifts. And I pointed this out. The word gifts in Greek is charismata, which is the plural form of charis, which is the word you hear me talk about a lot because it means grace. So charismata is the plural form in Greek of the singular word charis, which means grace. So the gifts are the graces of the Holy Spirit. The same grace that saved you sanctifies you. The same amazing grace that forgave you is also what fills you. The same grace, that grace that saved you and, and, and enabled you to become a child of God is the same grace, the gifts of God 
that gets manifested in the expressions of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life through the gifts. So it's spiritual, they are, they are uh, graces, and then verse seven, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, and we made this point, and this is why uh, the gifts of the Spirit are not like Benjamin Millionaire's uh, chess set, which is a thing that stands by itself. The gifts of the Spirit are never by themselves. It, the, they are the manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who's doing the healing or the encouraging or the teaching or the serving, but it's happening through human means. That's what that, that's what it means. So let's talk, I want to talk to you about a few other of the gifts. And I want to first talk to you about encouragement. Romans 12, 8, if it is to encourage, then uh, Paul says, by all means, give encouragement. Use, use, use that. We have a lady in this church, uh, many people, uh, some of you know her, uh, many of you uh, may, may know her. Uh, her, her name's Karen Revis. And she is the epitome of the gift, the spiritual gift of encouragement. She, uh, so for, for years, my early years here, I was amazed at the, at the notes that she would write to me. And she would write, you know, not just like your birthday, but just, uh, I mean, whenever spirit leads her, she would write this note to me and she'd be, it'd be so encouraging, full of scripture, full of, of just encouragement about how the Lord was using me, about the, about the ministry, about our family, just, I mean, whatever, I mean, just overflowing often had just a wonderful sense, not only of love with it, but uh, a kind of pro found insight that was with it. And then you could see, she'd go on the front, then she'd go on the back of the car, and then she'd run out, and she'd start going vertically up the side, and then she'd go across the top, and then she'd come back this way, and then you gotta turn up this way because it was this way, because she just like, she's just spilling over with it. And I just thought, it's so amazing that, you know, I'm the special one that Karen writes all these notes to. And uh, some years ago, we had a big, a big uh, birthday celebration for Karen, and a bunch of people were there. Uh, for this big celebration, a bunch of church people were there. And people got to start saying things. And, and somebody stood up and said, you know the amazing thing about Karen is these notes that I get. And I'm like, man, somebody else gets the notes. And then somebody else stood up and said, you know, I love all those notes. And we realized, all these people were getting these notes all the time. It's just spilling over in there. What is that? Well, that's the gift of encouragement. The word encourage uh, here in the Greek language, I want you to know this because I love this word, is parakaleo which comes from para, you, you know that, that prefix para, like parallel, and it means alongside of, okay? Like a parallel means running alongside of each other like that. So it comes from para, and it comes from a Greek verb kaleo, which means to call. Now this is really uh, important because this word para kaleo is also related directly to the word parakletos, which is Jesus's term that he uses in John 15, 26 to describe the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, he calls the parakletos, which is just the noun form of parakaleo to encourage. He called the Holy Spirit the one who is the encourager. So that's the word Paul's talking about here in this spiritual gift that is called encouragement. So. I point that out because if Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the parakletos, the encourager, when you are encouraging people, you're doing something very, very much like God. It is the nature of God. This idea of the parakletos, the one who's called alongside, it gets translated in a lot of different ways. And interesting, I read in, uh, this week in one central African culture, they translate it as the one who falls down. And I'm like, what? And the reason they do is because the image is if someone has, has been taken hurt or uh, ill on the side of the road and a passerby comes to help them, they get down with them. And so they use the word to mean one who's fallen down next to someone else who's in need. Wow. The encourager is also an image of one who is called in to help. And that's where you get the idea of an advocate. In 1 John, Jesus is called the parakletos, an advocate. And that's an image, a legal image, of when you've been accused and you don't know what to do about it, you have an advocate legally who stands in the gap on your behalf. That's encouragement. And when we're discouraged, we just need someone who has a supernatural capacity to help reframe the story of our lives. The power to prevail and to endure comes 
when we have someone that puts courage into us. So people need more than just a pep talk. They need something supernatural, and that's what happens in encouragement. It's not superficial. It's not what Jeremiah spoke about when he said some false prophets say peace, peace, when there's no peace. It's not superficial, but it is profound in that you don't fix somebody when you encourage them, but you help them face what they need to face because they're going to make it through it, and you've been called alongside of them. Encouragement's the currency of heaven and discouragement is the currency of hell, who wouldn't want the gift, the spiritual gift of encouragement? I wanna talk about leadership. Romans 12, eight, the one who leads, leads with zeal, do so passionately. Uh, I was looking back at a sermon that I preached in 2010, and I saw that I'd made comments about the gift of leadership, and I wanna read you verbatim what I wrote in 2010. 10, I said, this is a very important gift, the spirit-empowered capacity to lead God's people successfully while keeping a servant's heart. People with this gift usually have supernatural wisdom to see programmatic and administrative solutions that help the church. And I then had this line, Pastor Chris Lawson demonstrates this gift regularly. I look to him for it. Have you ever searched for a spiritual solution and found that nothing would quite fit and then there's one adjustment in the logistics and suddenly it opens up right? And I wrote these words, 2010, we had been laboring for a solution to a problem at Rinalda. Our church is full, what do we do? This is 2010, no place for people to sit. And Pastor Chris said, I've got an idea. We could start a new worship venue using a video cast in the fellowship hall. And so we did. And in short order, our attendance had grown. But what we never realized is what we started back in 2010 of trying, could we do the sermon by video and have a different band and the people, we didn't know it was going to become a multi-site model where we have four campuses and we've been able to expand our mission uh, two or threefold. So leadership is anointed of the Holy Spirit and becomes a gift when there is a supernatural unction on it. Let's talk about mercy. I love the gift of mercy. Romans 12 verse 8, the one who does acts of mercy do so with cheerfulness. The mercy gift enables a person supernaturally to feel what others are feeling. A mercy gift empowers someone to be able to love and care for others who are in need, not because they ought to, but because they feel it so deeply that they want to. It's as if they must care. The mercy gift is so beautiful because it almost has a prophetic quality to it because a person full of mercy may become aware not by human intuition or intellect, but may become aware of what someone else is feeling and therefore what they're experiencing in life. And the connection then becomes powerful and palpable And the mercy heart then starts overflowing with a desire to help, and that turns usually into prayer. Pastor Brandon has this gift beautifully. Uh, He will, at times I've been praying with him and praying for people, and you can just see when this comes upon him that the Holy Spirit is granting his pastor's heart a mercy that then often erupts in tears, doesn't have to, but feels almost down to his very bones, almost shaking with it, a sense like what the Holy Spirit himself does where he begins to intercede with groans that are too deep for words. And we need to have the mercy gift be accompanied, Paul says, by being cheerful about it. What does he mean by that? It doesn't mean cheerful like you, you have a mercy given, you go into a difficult, hard place where there's grief or pain and you're just chipper. That's not what it means. What it means is that when you have mercy by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you not only don't mind being in that place that others would avoid because there's pain or struggle or hardship there, but you're glad to be there. 
Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. And God gives this to me, and I'm so thankful for it. I don't ever, I don't ever feel like someone says, come over, Pastor. Um, my beloved spouse is dying. I don't, I don't ever go, no, I, don't, I want to run the other direction. No, I, 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 I'm glad. I'm glad to hold someone's hand in the holy moments of making a transition to heaven. I'm glad to be amongst those that mourn when you have mercy. You know, Jesus healed because he loved people. And oftentimes in the scripture, you'll see it said that Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion. That's why he sometimes wanted to go take a nap and get by himself, but he was stirred with this mercy. It's the heart of God. Oh, ask God for that gift. I want to talk a little bit more about the revelatory gifts or the prophetic gifts. We said last time that the idea of prophecy is not like Old Testament prophecy where there were thunderous rebukes from the Jeremiah's and the Amos's. Not like the Old Testament prophets were expected to be infallible or else they were condemned as false prophets. No, we're told in Corinthians that the New Testament prophecy is for upbuilding, for encouragement, and consolation. And we're told that when we get prophetic words, we're to weigh them, which means that they're not coming perfectly, and we need to discern, does that really feel like it bears witness to me? I almost wish we had a different word for our day than prophecy because it's been misunderstood and abused. We're talking about supernatural, revelatory words that bring encouragement, and people know that God has spoken. Let's talk about a few of these revelatory gifts. Discernment, 1 Corinthians 12, 10. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. Some years ago, an elder came to me, and many years ago, said, I had a dream in which you had been approached by God, and he offered you the gift of discernment, and you said no. And uh, I said, he said, did you say no to uh, the gift of discernment? I said, of course not. I would never decline a gift of the Holy Spirit from the living Lord. What are you talking about? Take that dream home with you. <clears throat> I didn't put it exactly like that, but we, this elder, we kind of spoke to each other that way. And, uh, but a few days later, I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well... And I had in my mind at that time the idea that my plate is pretty full of seeing needs all the time. And I struggle, you know, about trying not to figure out I got to fix them all. And I think that maybe I had thought that discernment means that now I'm going to walk in the room. And not only do I see all the needs that are present, but I'm going to see every demon and every other dark thing and every other problem. And I got to do something about that. And the Lord really helped me see, no, that's not what the gift of discernment is about. To discern something that, that is a problem doesn't mean you're supposed to fix the problem. It might just mean you're supposed to avoid the problem. It might mean that you are going to distinguish between spirits, meaning knowing what is evil and what is of God. And that maybe God just wants you to pray. Or maybe God wants you to know who to link arms with or who to not link arms with. It's a very valuable gift. The word of wisdom is mentioned in uh, verse 8. To one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom. And this is a kind of revelation that can happen through you in which there is perhaps a confusing situation or a stalemate or a dilemma and there just seems to be no way forward except for a supernatural word of wisdom. And this happened to me, I think, one time years ago when a man came seeking counseling because he was believing he was called to a new vocation and his wife didn't believe it was good or godly. He told me about the new vocation and honestly, I didn't bear witness to it and I didn't think it was a particularly noble vocation. But he was so positive in his mind that this was God and that his wife was standing in the way that their marriage was in jeopardy. And I thought, how in the world can we move forward? There was no way to talk him into, hey, maybe your wife is right. And while I'm sitting there praying about this, 
a story, an image from many, many years earlier came right up into my mind. And it was a story of a case in which I had been offered a scholarship to go to Israel for five weeks. But we had just had our baby boy, and Anne had no grace for me to go off for five weeks when we had a baby boy at home. I felt like it was God, and I was supposed to go, and she didn't have grace for it. And so I realized that the higher priority was for me to honor my wife and to cultivate our marriage, and I stayed home. Well, a, a year later, I got offered the same trip. She had grace for it, and I went. I told the man that little story because I, I was essentially saying perhaps there's a way in which there's something that you feel really is God, but there's a higher priority with your wife. And instead of trying to talk him out of the job, let him see that image. And I think it just came like a word of wisdom, and it's like the light just turned on. You see what I'm saying? So sometimes when you're in that, you just ask the Lord, would you give a word of wisdom here? The word of knowledge is uh, similar to this, but it often comes with visions or impressions or just knowing something that maybe the Lord wants to address, maybe something that the Lord wants to heal. To another, the utterance of knowledge, verse 8, according to the same spirit. And, you know, this is like uh, sometimes it just comes up in these images in a prophetic way. My assistant, Laura Hull, is fantastic and everything she does in our work, uh, and, and I, I, love, I love partnering with her. But one of the things, a tremendous gift about getting work with is she has a beautiful revelatory gift. And the way it shows up with Laura all the time is she just gets images. It just, it just pops right in her mind from the Holy Spirit. And it's just fantastic. So just, I mean, it happens all the time. But I was thinking about our spy family, and it made me remember a story from some years ago that we were at the New Year's blessing service, and after everybody had been having a blessing spoken over for the new year, Laura and a team came to bless me and my family. And the night before, by some fluke, our family had gotten out our old DVD of the, of the animated movie, The Incredibles. And we had just enjoyed watching The Incredibles, and we came in on Sunday morning, and afterwards, Laura begins the time of blessing, and she began with these words. I just have this image that came in my mind of you guys are the Incredibles. <laughs> and she began to just speak out blessing about how, you know, God was doing incredible things. And of course, what, what was happening there was immediately we go, that's not a fluke, that's not a coincidence, that can't, that can't have happened, God has our attention. So God brings impressions like that. And the, all of these gifts that we've talked about last week in this, they really in the end are not like us and our spy gadgets. Because what really, the only image that makes sense of this, Paul says in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 12, just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. And no other illustration really makes sense except to say the gifts are like you're a member of the body and the hand and the foot and the eye and the mind all need each other because we are so intimately connected. You have, if you're a Christian, gifts of the Spirit, some you may not even be quite aware of, and it's time for them to be fanned into flame, and the Lord says, eagerly desire, so ask him. He may just be ready to give you a new gift, and that's the gospel. Back and forth. Dave and Kathy Wharfs, uh, good. I mean, we have known each other forever and uh, love each other so much. And, uh, oh, we could just go on and on and reminisce about the times. David was just so involved uh, with a few others and getting our whole radio ministry launch, old radio guy and all that. So we've been very, very close over the years. And um, we want uh, to give you a chance uh, to share about a miracle uh, that took place uh, through a healing gift and a word of knowledge gift, uh, as we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And it relates and goes back far uh, in your life, David, of a battle with fear and panic. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. And, um, and, and Kathy, you can also, uh, from watching it for the years, help us understand how debilitating this is. There'll be people that are going to identify with this story who've experienced similar painful anxiety. Thank you, Helen. Well, mine started when I was uh, 
15 years old and playing junior varsity football. And that's all I ever wanted to do. It was the first game of the season. And uh, I got clipped on the way to make a tackle. And it hurt. But I went into what they called at that time shock. And I was rolled to the hospital at 15 years old on an ambulance. And my father was in the rescue squad that was there. And everybody came in. And it, there really wasn't a whole lot wrong with my knee. And I didn't know till years later that's what fear can turn a real episode and shoot you over a cliff of fear and anxiety. For the next many years, I carried that with me and fought panic and anxiety to the point that I couldn't get things done. Several trips to the hospital saying it was a heart attack, you know, because you go from a knee to the heart. You knew you were going to die because that's what I envisioned every time I saw it was the hearse and everybody and everything else. And I could visualize all that. And then I married this young lady. And for 20 years of our marriage, she's the one that helped me. Mm. Well, <clears throat> like Alan says, um, it affects the whole family. It's not just you. Um, trips to the hospital, e even in good times when you would think everything's going fine and you're getting, you're packing for the vacation you have to stop and go to the emergency room. And um, Dave started traveling for his work. And I was home with the two boys and teaching school. And Dave would call invariably in the middle of the night and say, just talk to me. Just mm -hmm. talk to me. Yeah. I just need to hear your voice. And um, so I would talk to him. <laughs> and I... Uh, I don't know how this came about, but I would say, David, just go outside. Go outside that hotel room and look up in the sky and look at the stars and just think about who made those stars and who's taking care of you. Mm. He's a big God. He can take care. Well, that helped momentarily. <laughs> mm. But. So, David, you, you were uh, trying to get treatment of this in every way. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I went to Christian psychologist, uh, more than one. I had a very good friend of mine in Gaffney who was an internist, and he was a brother in Christ. Uh, he was helping me, and he had prescribed Xanax. So I carried for, I guess, about 17 years three Xanax rolled up and I could figure out a square of toilet paper would hold three. You know, I could fold that up and stick it in my pocket. And every time I took one, I felt like I was loser because I had to give in to take the drug. And uh, I got to, when we moved up here, I was not only traveling, but I was going to other countries. And I mean, I'd take two Xanax to get on the plane and then two to get off, and so it was It was not a good thing. Well, you know, uh, and as, as of course, as, as you know, and we want to affirm, and when we, uh, 100%, we encourage uh, uh, medical care, medical treatment, counseling, all of that is good. It just, it just didn't, it just wasn't doing it. So let's fast forward. Fast forward. We've got, we got, what year was it? 1996, October the 4th. I had barely ar arrived here, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we had a special guest preacher, evangelist, minister, healing evangelist that was here that I was just meeting, Clark Taylor. Clark Taylor was here and had been here before. A lot of you that are been around Renault. I think it, this was a, Australian guy. Australia. Love to hear him speak, just to hear that Australian accent. And so on Sunday night, um, he was speaking and he stopped speaking and he was in that l big pulpit on the left. That, that He was up there high and he stopped right in the middle of his talk and he said, there's someone right out here right in this area that's battling panic attacks and anxiety. You need to come up and have prayer. He would get, he would get these kinds of words of knowledge very specific and regularly throughout the evening. 
And what did you do? <laughs> Kathy's giving him that. She's like, I've been living with this for 20 years. This is your time. She said, go. And, and at the time, my name was up to be an elder in the church. And I said, you know, if I go up there and acknowledge that I got anxiety and panic, who would want to vote for that guy? <laughs> so he just, he, he, nothing happened. So he went back to speaking and he, he said, it's just too strong. It's just entirely too strong. There's someone right out here that's <laughs> battling panic and anxiety. And you need to come forward. I'm and surprised a, you didn't just take his hand and raise it up or something. About eight point. rows you, in front of us, a gentleman stood up, and I was on my pew going, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and this gentleman came up, had prayer. He came back. Clark was here for four nights, and I'll speed this up. Anyway, this gentleman came back the next night, and his wife talked about he had not driven a car in 13 years. He was a manager of a retail store here in town. His staff would drive him to the bank, to the post office, to meetings, and so on about the store. And that night, after Clark Taylor had prayed for him, his wife said she heard the garage door go up and the car start. So she called the sheriff's department. <laughs> And they're telling this story up front, and my bride's listening to all of this, and I am too. And anyway, come long story short, sheriff's deputies were there talking to her. When he pulled back, she just knew he'd pulled over somewhere and couldn't get home. And he pulls up and comes in and says, what's going on? She says, what are you doing? He says, I'm healed. I don't have that fear anymore. So he told that story. So I will let her tell the rest of it because I never went up. Now, you, you believed in spiritual gifts. Oh, and, I, I mean, you believed in all gifts, but, but, you, but your hesitancy was, say, I mean, so you're, you don't want to, it's the appearance of it. Well, not only the appearance, but, but I didn't really believe I could be here. Okay, so that's a. That's I've been a going, that's been going on since 15. You can believe in spiritual gifts, but not think it's for, for you. Yeah. So, you so to, Kathy, you tell about how well, you got to work then at the Clark Taylor meeting. He... He would not go up, so uh, the session ended, and worship's over. He's preached. Over. Ministry's over. It's over. People are leaving, and Dave goes over to talk to Jan and Bill Rice, and I go get Clark Taylor. <laughs> That's a good wife. <laughs> and I said, "You just have to pray for my husband," and he didn't flinch. He came right back to. Well, he's the, out in the lobby or something. He was, he's yeah, meeting's he over. Shaking, shaking hands. hands at the end. And telling everybody bye. So you don't have to have the mood music and no, you don't have to have, okay. Doesn't even have to be the one. It mm -hmm. can be just a friend or a mm -hmm. loved one or wife. So I'm talking to Bill and Jen and I whirl around and this gentleman is face to face with me. And he says, I understand. And he went through and he said, I want to pray for you. And I said, well, okay. Well, again, I don't think it's going to work for me. So he put his hand on my chest and I'd already made up my mind I wasn't going to go down. Okay, I wasn't going to lay out. So I had one foot in the pew and one foot on the ground. And he, he prayed, and he finished praying, and he took his hand away, and he said, you don't think this is going to work? I said, no, sir. He said, well, I'm going to pray again. This time he put his hand on my chest and I knew he had put something in his hand. <laughs> Cause remember those buzzers you used to have a hundred years ago, you put your hand, somebody squeeze it. It felt so hot. It had to have been artificial right in the middle of my chest. And he's praying and he's spitting while he's praying. And I'm going, Oh Lord, you know, this is just can't work. And he finished and he said, you don't think it's going to work? I said, no, sir. He took a big breath and he said, I'm going to pray one more time because I know that I know that I know it can come out of there. He put his hand on my chest. I don't know how I got down in that pew to this day, but I'm prone on it. He's down near me praying. And all I could feel, Alan, was I knew something was about to come up and just out. And I thought, I'm going to throw up all over this guy. This is not going to be pretty. That feeling went straight through my heart, I mean my throat, and right out the top of my head. And I've never taken a Xanax since October the 4th, 1996. 
And it's not Clark Taylor. It's not Alan. It's not Kathy. It's the Holy Spirit. But you've got to have all of these to push an old toad like me in to get prayed for. Isn't that a great story? Give praise to God. And thank you guys so very, very much. Um, you know, and uh, to anybody online, you're hearing that story and you're just going, well, that's just wild. I don't even know about that. Well, you know, we tell our stories and they're just our stories. They're just what they are. I mean, sometimes you just got to hear something and go, even if you're skeptical and you go, I don't know what I think, but that's just a real story. And I just want to say, I uh, have known David for 25 years or however long we've been here. And um, it is true through and through. And uh, Ethan, thank you for sharing. Thank you for showing us how God can come and speak right in the middle of our darkest times. God is so, so good. Praise the Lord. Guys, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah.
Oh, Father, we just thank you. The more we know you, the better you are to us. The more that we learn of you, the greater we see you are. The more that we taste of your grace, the more we see how wonderful you are in all of your ways. You're good all the time. There's never a time that you're not good. There's never a time you're not perfectly, benevolently kind towards your children. And so, Lord, we pray, leave us so full of confident faith, refreshed in your spirit, that as we go forth from here, that blessing, powerful, spirit-filled blessing expressed in our speech and in the gifts of the Spirit in our lives will be used to bless someone else. We pray that. And we pray, Father, for anyone here tonight that needs a special touch of healing or encouragement. We pray for healing and freedom and deliverance. And we pray, Father, that Christ be lifted up. We're so thankful to you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We have Marion and Bridget in the back that are uh, able and ready to pray with you. Maybe you want to ask the Lord for a spiritual gift and ask for them to lay hands on you. Our prayer table's open. Prayer requests can be made. We still got... The desserts are out. So uh, you can do both prayer and dessert if you would like. Hadn't it been a wonderful evening together? Let's give some thanks and praise to God for a wonderful evening together. And may the Lord God bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen. And amen.